I did not realize that we were supposed to finish Beowulf today. <laughs> yeah, not happening today, not happening next week, probably not happening the week after that. Because <clears throat> remember, two weeks from today, we don't have class because I'm having surgery to try to fix my arm and hand. Um, so, we are picking up with Fit 8, all of line 499. <clears throat> um, so we talked the other day a little bit about ages, Beowulf's age, Hrothgar's age, and we don't know conclusively how old either of them are. We, we do know, because I gave you some information that's going to come up later on, that Hrothgar rules for 50 years before Grendel comes. Okay? Grendel comes for 12 years, so that's 62 years. Hrothgar is somewhere probably between 18 and 30 when he becomes king. So when Beowulf shows up in the story, or in the poem, Hrothgar is somewhere between 80 and 92. Okay? So when Grendel came, uh, let me rephrase that. When Grendel came, Hrothgar is somewhere between 68 and 80, which is probably why he sits down and mourns. He's no longer strong. <clears throat> and we talked about the passage where, you know, when Wolfgar tells him Beowulf is here, Hrothgar gives us that little enigmatic passage, I knew him as a boy, okay? And then later on when Beowulf comes in, Hrothgar says, you're doing this to repay a debt. He implies it's to repay a debt. A debt that his father incurred on Beowulf by Hrothgar having uh, paid the Ware Guild for his having killed Hegelaf. And Hrothgar tells us at that point that he was newly in his kingship when he did that for Edgedale. Okay? And I argue that Edgedale had his wife and child with him at that point. Because it's very unlikely Hrethel would have given his daughter in marriage to an exile. That made almost impossible he would have done that. Okay? Which means Beowulf, if Beowulf was alive when they were exiled, because it could have been Beowulf was born during that 50 years. Okay? Um, but if Beowulf was alive then, then Bill was pretty old too at this point. So, leave all that aside. Unferth spoke. And in the manuscript I mentioned, it always reads Hunferth. And his name, a lot of people don't, don't want to look at names and try to figure out etymologically kind of what they mean, because sometimes they don't really mean anything. Beowulf's name means Beowulf. B-E-E, -E, wolf, okay? So what's a wolf of bees? Bear. And it's from bear that you get the Old Norse word berserker. Bear, zerker, shirt, okay? Because it was thought, it was a practice for Old Norse warriors to get into this mindset of bear-like rage, okay? Shape-shifting, in other words. Not literal shape-shifting, but becoming like bears, losing human thought rationality. So, <coughs> Beowulf, bear kind of a thing. And if you look at that old Norse analog that I mentioned the other day, both for Bjarki, that refers to also Bear, and that guy, if I remember correctly, is a shapeshifter. I could be wrong there. Um, that might just, might just be my pre-Alzheimer's mind making things up out of the thin air. 
So, Unfer speaks, and he begins what's called a flicking episode. Okay? Flicking also comes from Old Norse, and it's a verbal challenge. It has rules to it. I mean, it's, it's very specific. And what happens in a flit is someone new is coming into the hall, coming into the home, etc., and not the <coughs> owner of the hall, not the lord, not the chief, but someone lower than him challenges that person. Okay? Modern equivalent. This is like a bouncer in a bar. You don't pay the cover charge. You don't come in. This is the guy who stands at the door and essentially says, not give me five bucks, but show me your credentials. So the flit is a verbal challenge to get the other person to present his, what's also called, this is used a lot today, bona fides, or bona fides if you want. His good faith. Show me that you are who you say you are. Job interview today, this is what? It's not the resume. It's the references on the resume. The people that someone can call to find out if you are who you say you are. So Unferth gives Beowulf this long challenge. And notice, it's kind of rude. Okay? So, we're told... Unferth spoke, son of Edgelaf, who sat at the feet of the shielding lord, unbound his battle runes. Now, notice what we're told there. He sits at Hrothgar's feet. This is an important image. So, think of the hall. We're looking at the inside of the hall. Here's Hrothgar. Unferth is down here at his feet. His wife, Welthael, She's kind of flitting around. She's moving back and forth, right? So Uther sits at his feet. Beowulf is standing here, surrounded by his geekish men. Okay. Where's Hrothgar? Both physically and metaphorically. Or what is Hrothgar? King and, therefore, center of the hall. Center of society, the most important thing. Who's sitting at his feet? Unfer. That means he's also at the center. Right? This is going to be important because of what Beowulf's going to say. We're told Beowulf's journey vexed Unfer. What does it mean to vex? To confuse. It, it troubles him. Okay? Why? For he did not wish that any other man on this middle earth should care for glory under the heavens more than he himself. He doesn't want Beowulf to get any more glory than he has. Okay? Now, what has Beowulf already told us? In his opening speech to Hrothgar, he kind of gives his bona fides, not in terms of the references, but in terms of what? He says, I slew five, or I captured five, slew a tribe of giants, fought sea monsters, defended the coast of the Geats, etc., etc. In other words, my people have seen me bloodied, and yet, you know, like the Terminator coming out of the fire. They can't kill me, right? So unfair. His name, by the way, I mentioned names. Mar Peace or Mar Faith, or by Mar, you can just put un. Un peace, not peace. Unfaith, not faith. So, are you the Beowulf who strove with Brecca in a swimming contest on the open sea? What does that tell us? What is, what is Unferth relating? This is one of the things, you know, Beowulf scholars have really been kind of curious about. It's a story about Beowulf. This is one, possibly, 
of those stories that Rothgar said we've heard about. Okay? No other story about Beowulf and Brecca survives, if there ever was one. So, are you the Beowulf who strove with Brecca in a swimming contest on the open sea? Were you in your pride? You tried the waves and for a foolish boast risked your life in the deep water. Notice, you acted out of pride and foolishness, he said. No one could dissuade you from that, he says. Where you swam in the sea, there you seized in your arms the ocean streams, blah, 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 blah. And so what happened? You toiled for seven nights. That is, they swam in the open ocean. What ocean would this have been? Baltic Sea. Between Sweden and Germany. Cold, 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 cold water. Seven nights, fully armed, mail coats. I've put on a coat of mail before, just the shirt. They're like 60 pounds. Seven nights swimming with 60 pounds and a sword that probably weighs 10 or 12 pounds at least. Well, again, what are we being told? Not real. This isn't the real world that we inhabit. This is a mythological time. These are mythological heroes. This is like the stories of Troy, okay? And the reason I'm emphasizing that is I'm, later on I'm going to talk about a couple of critics who talk about the marvels or demarvels in Beowulf. So, he outswam you, he had more strength in the morning, the swells bore him to the hithering shore, from thence he sought his sweet land, and, you know, he fulfilled his boast. Right? Like the wanderer says, the good nobleman fulfills his boast. So I expect a worse outcome from you. You couldn't even win a swimming contest. And you're going to defeat Grindel? Right? What's he just done? He's challenged him. In the flicking contest, or episode, what the respondent then does is he responds to everything that's said and gives his proofs. Right? So look what Beowulf says. It's almost like Paul, if you're familiar with radio, Paul Harvey, now dead, used to have a radio show where he'd tell part of his story and he'd say, and after the break, I'll give you the rest of the story. So Beowulf's going to give us the rest of the story. What a great deal, Unferth, my friend. Right? Sounds like a member of Congress. Talking to somebody whose guts he absolutely hates. My highly respected friend on the other side of the aisle. Drunk with beer. What's he just accused Unferth of? One, being drunk. What else? Everything he says, it's uttered by a drunk. Therefore, you can discount it. Drunk with beer, you have said about Brecca. Told his adventures. I will tell the truth. In other words, now for the rest of the story. I had greater strength on the sea, more ordeals on the wave than any other man. When we were just boys, we two agreed and boasted. We were both still in our youth. Still in our youth kind of implies what? Define the age of youth. It's not one to five. It's not even one to 10. Teenager 16, 13 to 20, possibly something like that. I mean, I'm 61. I look back at my youth as 20s, 30s, <laughs> even 40s, you know. That out on the great ocean, we would risk our lives, and we did just that. Okay, so he says, yeah, we were young. What usually is the next phrase that comes after that? It's stupid. <laughs> Thank you. Okay? Like when I lived on Lookout Mountain and I would drive my Toyota Corolla down, if you've ever been there, down Ox Highway at about 65, 70 miles an hour. No. 
Yeah, that's when I was kind of suicidal. <laughs> Stupidly. So, he says, we had bare swords when we swam in the sea, hard in our hands. That is, we're swimming, one hand holding a sword and, you know, dog paddling or something with the other. Why would they have swords in their hands? Sea monsters. We thought to protect ourselves from whales. Not for anything could he swim far from me on the sweet waves, sea waves more swiftly on the water, nor would I go from him. That is, we would try to get away from each other, and we couldn't. Look, the Bible says, I tried to get away, Brecca kept up with me. We were together on the sea for five nights. Unfer said, seven, seven, okay, until the flood drove us apart. The waves. And a northern wind, knife sharp, pushed against us. The seas were choppy, the fishes of the sea were stirred up. There my coat of ar armor offered help. Hard hand locked against those hostile ones. What hostile ones? The sea monsters. Because what do they do? Down to the ocean floor, a grisly foe dragged me. I don't know how deep the Baltic Ocean is, but it's more than 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 feet. Gripped me fast in his grim grasp, but yet, yet it was given to me to stab that monster with the point of my sword, my war blade. Okay. Time and again, those terrible enemies sorely threatened. So, not just one. So he's been dragged down to the ocean floor. What kind of breathing apparatus does he have? His lungs. I think the world record for holding one's breath is something like four and a half minutes. Mm, four and a half minutes is not going to be enough time. Yeah, I know. It's mind-boggling to get you down that deep. So. Doesn't it actually take beat the world record for the Avatar movie with like six minutes or something? Oh, that I don't know. I don't pay any attention to Avatar, so. I served them well with my dear sword as they deserved. They got no joy from their gluttony, those wicked man-eaters, when they tasted me. Notice the metaphor he's using. They brought him down to feast on him. Instead, they feasted on his sword. In the morning, wounded by my blade, they were washed ashore by the ocean waves, dazed by sword blows, blah, blah, blah. Light shone from the east, meaning it was the sunrise. Okay? And then Beowulf said, Beowulf. Not the poet, not the show recounting the tale. Beowulf says, God's bright beacon. The sun, he says, is emblematic of God. Because beacon doesn't only mean light, like a lighthouse. Beacon also means sign and symbol. So, the waves grew calm so that I could see the sea cliffs, the wind swept waves, weird often spares, an undoomed man. Okay, notice, weird, what will be will be, fate, often spares an undoomed man. That's why he's spared, because he's undoomed. The word there is unfaya, and the faya is related to the word for feud. Okay? When his courage endures. So Beowulf's kind of telling us, you know, if you go out to try to fight fate, you might just be able to turn it a little bit. He's suggesting weird isn't like the Greek notion of fate. That no matter what happens, whatever's fated is going to occur. Right? So he says, and so it was that with my sword I slew nine. He counted them of these sea monsters. I've never heard of a harder night battle under heaven's vault, nor more a wretched man on the water stream. Yet I escaped alive. Weary from my journey, then the sea washed me up the currents of the flood in the land of the fins. If you look at the map that I've got on the um, D2L, you know, Sweden's, Sweden kind of comes down here, Norway's over here, there's a mountain range that separates Sweden from Norway. And then way up over here, is Finland, which borders Russia. It is approximately from where the land of the geese is in southern Sweden. It's about 500 miles. 
So I spent five nights in the sea and swam, was carried by the currents, 500 miles away. I think it's 500. And where did you start from? Probably southern tip of Sweden. He and Brekka jumped, that's where the Geats lived. He and Brekka jumped into the ocean there. I mean, there's no reason that they would, you know, take horses right up all the way to the north, northeast coast of Sweden so that when they jump off, you know, Finland's just over the water. What are we being told again? What, what movie franchise would Beowulf fit in with? MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He'd fit right in there with, you know, Thor and all those guys. Not Tony Stark, because everything he does, it's all mechanical. There's no power there, okay? But Thor and Hulk and, you know, it's marvelous. It's unreal. It's fantastic in that sense. I've never heard a word about any such contest concerning you. Such sword panic. <laughs> it just slaps him down. In the play of battle, Brecca has never, nor you either, done a deed so bold and daring with his decorated blade. I would never boast of it. <laughs> Which he just did, obviously. There's a rhetorical term that describes what he just did, and I don't remember what it is. And then Beowulf some says something else that goes beyond the rules of the flipping episode. Though you became your brother's killer, you're next of kin. So he's just called Unferth what? Kinslayer. <laughs> Who's attacking Herod every night? Grindel. Who's Grindel's daddy? Way, 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 way back. Cain. The first? Where does Unferth sit? At the very center of the hall. In other words, as Hamlet says, and we can apply it to the Danes, something's rotten in the state of Denmark. And where are we told the fish always rots? From the head down. Okay, what's... You've got a kinslayer who is the advisor. Because Uferth isn't, you know, a court jester. By sitting at Hrothgar's feet, that's telling us he's Hrothgar's really kind of his most trusted advisor. In the job that he has, is Thula, and it will get spelled T-H-U-L-E, right? And that person's job is kind of like the court historian and press secretary. So he's the, his job is to remember all the glorious deeds of the past and to challenge anybody who comes in. And he's a kinsman. Should Hrothgar have, sitting at his feet, a kinslayer? This, by the way, is probably Tolkien's source for Grima Wormtongue in The Lord of the Rings, who sits at the feet of Theoden, King Theoden, whose name, by the way, means King King, because Theoden means king, okay? Not king of kings, King King. It's all of Okay, so, though you became your brother's killer, you're next of kin. For that, you needs must suffer punishment in hell. In the Old English, does read in hell. Not a Norse idea, not a Germanic idea. That's what? That is entirely Christian. It's not a Greek idea, it's not a pagan idea, it's not a heathen idea. It is only found in Christianity. 
And this comes from Beowulf's mouth. Okay? Beowulf, let me make it very, very clear. Beowulf is not Christian at all. Doesn't know Jesus in any way. Never heard of him. Okay? So you got to suffer in hell, buddy, no matter how clever you are. And you've got a gloss. Udfirth's fratricide brings the general theme of kin slain, represented by Grendel's descent from Cain, inside Hrothgar's hall. It's kind of like, really? <laughs> in reality, at least in the reality of the heroic world depicted in poetry, it may not have been unthinkable for kinsmen to find themselves on opposite sides of a battle. Loyalty to one's lord was supposed to outweigh the claims of blood relation. Notice, was supposed to. The word hell is not in the manuscript, but it is attested by one of the early transcriptions. And that, what's meant by that is the manuscript that we have now, because of the crumbling, the word has disappeared. But when the poem was transcribed in the 1780s, when the manuscript was copied, and it was copied twice, okay, this Danish guy sent one guy over to copy it, he copied it, and that person, if I remember right, the first one, it was copied in modern English script, handwriting. The second guy copied it, and he copied it to look exactly like the Old English. He copied it in Old English writing. Okay? Both of those read hell where that it spot is in the manuscript now because the word still existed in 1785 in the manuscript. All right? So, notice, Mitchell and Robinson in their translation read hall. Why? Well, there's a couple reasons. One, they are de-Christianizing the poem. They have a mindset at the outset that the poem's old, it's pagan. Okay? So, I will say it truly, <coughs> son of Edgelaf. So his name means Mar Peace, Mar Faith. His father's name, Edge, means Edge, like sword edge, blade edge. Edge loth means leavings or what's left. Well, what's left when you sharpen a blade? Little metal filings. Not necessarily a great name. Okay? That never would Grendel have worked with such terror. So he's just one. He said, you're a kinslayer. And then he goes on. He's figuring, you know, in for a pound, in for, you know, a ton. <laughs> never would Grendel have worked such terror, that gruesome beast, against your lord. Or shames in Herod, if your courage and spirit were as fierce as you fancy they are. If you were half the man you say you are, Unfair, Grindel would be afraid to even approach. What's he telling us about Unfair from Beowulf's perspective? They mount nearby. Boaster. And yet when he sees what he has to contend with, his heart does what? Goes all French. Run away, run away, run away. You know, Monty Python reference there. So, he doesn't stop there. Because he then does what? He extrapolates from Unferth to the tribe of which Unferth is part. And nobody really addresses this passage. I mean, it's talked about, yes. But they don't address it the way I think it ought to be addressed. No storm of swords from the victory shieldings. No resistance at all from your nation. Okay, what does that mean? The victory shieldings. What's, what's it sound like? Aren't the shieldings what they get like from the king 
No, the, the Shieldings is just the name for this tribe. Sons of Shield. Remember? Shield, um, Sheving, when the poem began, was the waif who arrived. He had Baal or Beowulf, etc. Everybody descends from him. Um, in the Norse version, these are the Skjoldungs. S-K-J-O-L-D-U-N-G. These are real. These are real people, right? All kinds of historical references to them. They're the victory shieldings. What does the word victory imply before their names? America's called what? Home of the free, land of the brave. How brave are they? Grindel's been kicking their you-know-whats for 12 years. He's, he's all in, man. He's just, he's going there. He said, you and your mama and your brother that you killed. What? I mean, look at it. He's found that he, feed, that he need fear no feud. A feud has to have what? Two parties. There's no feud here. Grindle's just kicking you know what. And you guys... Roll over. No storm of swords from the victory shieldings. No resistance at all from your nation. Now, Beowulf's standing here. He's talking to Unfer. And who's sitting right behind Unfer? Keep talking. I'm sorry. So he indirectly wrote him crossbar. Yeah, it's kind of okay because he's not doing it too well. So. I don't know. That's why I said... It gets talked about, but the import of what Bales, nobody has really discussed, it, that I'm aware of. Because it seems, take that back. Some people say, Bales being entirely facetious in all this. He doesn't mean it. Really? <laughs> Tell me where in the text suggests that. Well, that claim is made because of the kind of poem it is. It's a heroic poem. Therefore, you don't doubt heroism. You can. <laughs> when I raised some of these questions years ago, back in the 1990s, on what's called ANSACS, International Anglo-Saxon Listserv, okay? and I raised some questions like about this passage and some about Beowulf later on in the poem. You thought that I would have said, you know, the Pope was, pick your worst adjective, or your mama was. I mean, because there was, I mean, it's like my screen was sparkling with incoming missiles. I mean, a lot of people went, ape, you know, but crazy. There were a few pretty big names who said, you know, these are some pretty good questions that people haven't addressed, and they still, in print, haven't really addressed them. So. He goes on, no resistance at all from your nation. He takes his toll, spares no one in the Danish nation, but indulges himself, hacks and butchers and expects no battle from the spear Danes. How good are their spears? They're like four week old celery. I mean, he's accusing the Danes of what? Cowardice, really. Now, around Hrothgar, Unferd, Beowulf, Beowulf's men, there's what? Hrothgar's men. Beowulf and his men are unarmed. Hrothgar's men aren't unarmed. This is their hall. And they're probably going, what? Or what? <laughs> but I, I, will show him soon enough the strength and courage of the Geats in war. He's not afraid of the Danes. Oh, he's going to be afraid of the Geats. Afterward, let him who will go bravely to Mead. And it, in Beowulf is saying, when I'm done, come on in at midnight and have a drink. I'm going to kill Grindel. 
and you're going to be able to drink in your home. You're going to be able to get drunk again in your home at night. When the morning light of a new day, the sun clothed in glory, shines from the south on the sons of men. Why does it shine on the south? Because of how far north they are. Okay. Then the giver of treasure, that's proper, was greatly pleased, gray-haired and battle-bold. Maybe the poet's suggesting that Hrothgar's lost it. Gray-haired. Okay? But he doesn't take any offense. See, everything that I've kind of just suggested, most critics who do address this at all say, well, look, Hrothgar isn't upset. Therefore, it must be that Beowulf's words really don't mean anything to him. I don't know that that's the case. I think it's possibly more the case of, damn, look at that man. Uh, we can't kill Grendel. We sure as hell can't take him on. It would also be that, like, nobody, if you kill Lord, no one's going to be like, you suck. Like, this sucks. Don't None of his men are going to say, Hrothgar, get the hell off. <laughs> Come on, fight him. The bright Dane's chief had faith in his helper. What did Hrothgar say earlier about Beowulf? Why is Beowulf there? Not only for the repayment of the, his father's debt or oath. Why else? God sent him. So he has faith in his helper. Beowulf and via Beowulf, God. That shepherd of his folk recognized Beowulf's firm, firm resolution. I had a, a student several years ago, master student, write her master's thesis on the old English word that gets translated shepherd of his folk. And the old English word is hirda, or it's spelled various ways, okay? It means king. It means protector. Why? So why does it get translated shepherd? What does a shepherd do? Protects his sheep. And the people are the sheep. Okay? Notice, it's a metaphor. So, the shepherd of his folk recognized Beowulf's firm resolution. In other words, here's a boast. What? What comes next? That he can fulfill. Just like the Coast Guard said, a wise warrior has to be able to do what? Discern two things, words, deeds. Beowulf speaks some words, and he goes, I think you're a man of your word. That is, I think you can do what you say you can do. Unferth challenges him. You said you would win a swimming match. You lost the swimming match. Beowulf says, you only heard part of the story. You only heard Brecca's version. Now let me give you the full version. And then he just dumps on him. Hrothgar says, I believe you, Beowulf. There was laughter. Warriors' lovely sounds and winsome words. Welthael went forth. Hrothgar's queen, mindful of customs. Welthael. Let me write her name again so you can read it. Well, W-E-A-L-H. That's how it's spelled in modern English. Her name is two components. This word, wow, is the same word as you see in Wales or Welsh. We've already talked about what that means. Anybody remember? Same. Foreigner, exile. This word means either slave or servant. Foreign servant, foreign slave, exile servant, exile slave. Does that mean she was captured in battle? Is she says sex slave? No. Because we're going to be told she was married to Hrothgar to bring peace. Okay? Or it's going to be alluded to. We're not literally told that. Lots of criticism. A lot of trees died giving their lives for be careful how I say this because I don't want to say that again. 
but I, <laughs> I've got to. For some crazy feminists, not all feminists are crazy. These ones are crazy. For feminists to argue that wealthy on 200 women, you know, in the poem, their only purpose is to serve, to bring peace between warring nations, okay? It's, that's not what the poem suggests at all, okay? So, wealthy all does what? She's mindful of customs. And this is one of those things, readers prior to Tolkien, scholars prior to Tolkien, this is what they read the poem for. Oh, what are those ancient Germanic customs? What can this tell us about pagan Germany, you know? So, she's decked with gold, and she goes to the men in the hall. She takes a cup first. To Hrothra. Why? He's the Lord. He's the king. She bids him be merry at his beer drinking. See, that's one of the problems for the last 12 years. They've been a little too merry in their beer drinking, but we're not going to talk about that yet. With pleasure, he received the cup. The victorious king, notice, hasn't been so victorious the last 12 years. That's me saying that. It's not the poet, but I can't help but read context. What has Beowulf said about how victorious the Shieldings have been for a little while, a little bit? Not very. Then the lady of the Helmings, that's telling us her nationality. Helmings, children of Helm. What does Helm mean? Protector. Follow me. So the sons of the protector. Well, that's a good name for a chieftain. The protector, that's kind of what you want. She does what? She goes about to young and old. She gives it each his portion of the precious cup. And what that means is she goes down the line and she gives each person a sip from a common cup. Everybody drinks. Until she comes to Beowulf. She greeted the Brig Gatish Prince, thanked God with wise words that her wish had come to pass. What was her wish? That she could rely on any earl for relief from those crimes. Remember those lines we talked about <laughs> ad nauseum the other day, 175 to 188? You know, the guy who has to thrust his soul into the fires of praise is one who doesn't expect to change, one who doesn't seek any relief or comfort. She does. We're told she prayed for an earl who would be able to bring relief. Beowulf takes the cup, and then he speaks. Why? He's probably impressed by her. We're not told. Nowhere... We're not told anywhere... Wealthy as age. But we do know she has young sons. So she's probably relatively young too. 40 at the oldest. Probably more like 30, I would say. Meanwhile, Hrothgar's, you know, nearly in the grave. Hey, it says, is it like a slave? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Or servant. Servant of the blade. See, now that's a good name. That means, or blade servant. The blade is servant to him. He's good with a sword. Okay? So Beowulf speaks. I resolved when I sat out over the sea, sat down on my ship, that I would entirely fulfill the wishes of your people or fall slain. That is, I'm going to fulfill my boast or die trying. I shall perform a deed of manly courage. I can't help but think, when Beowulf says that, some of those Danes are probably going, what's he saying about us? Are we not manly, you know? Or in this meat hall, I will await the end of my days. These words well pleased that woman, the boasting of the geek. She went the gold adorned, and she sits beside Hrothgar. Okay? 
Then words are spoken, the people are all, all happy, and sun is setting, and Hrothgar says, time for me to check out. And we're told, Hrothgar and Beowulf greet each other, and Hrothgar tells Beowulf, 655 and following, I've never before left my hall in charge of another man. That is, those 30 days each night, not one of them is given the authority to hold the hall. That's what he's giving Beowulf. That essentially means, Beowulf, for tonight, you can sit in the big chair. He can salute the throne, which Grindel cannot. Have it and hold it, protect this best of houses, be mindful of glory, show your mighty valor, watch for your enemies. <laughs> and if you win, treasure. Treasure galore, you know. So Hrothgar and his troop of heroes, protector of the shelvings, departed the hall. The war chief wished to seek wealth out. Hold on a second. I've got to make sure. Fit 10. Line 6. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> he wished to seek wealth out his queen's bedchamber. No, that's not what it reads. Wolde Wiefruma, the glorious battle chief, Wolde, modern English wood, which means really desires or desired. Wealth out second to seek wealth out. Queen to Yebedon. Queen to Yebedon. Drop off the Y at the beginning and the on at the ending because modern English loses all those inflections. And what do you have? What verb? Queen to bed. He doesn't want to go to her bedchamber. He wants to take her to bed. That's what the text tells us. So he might be old, but he's still got some spark in him, you know? <laughs> Why does the poet tell us this? Is it just a little salacious detail for the teenage warriors in training, you know? Ooh! No, it's not that. In the beginning, kind of showing how, I guess, excited Rothgar is about the well, I think it's obvious he's excited. He doesn't have the little blue pills, you know. Is it because it's, the text says that Beowulf was impressed with her and to try and like cover up the idea of adultery is trying to divert that? Uh, I mean, it's a possibility. I don't think that's it. I think it's a juxtaposition. What is Beowulf getting ready to do? Die. Or maybe. Or kill Grendel. Meanwhile, what's on Rothgar's mind? Sex. Yeah. I mean, life-changing, I mean, maybe sex can be a life-changing event. Life-changing, possibly, event, the battle with Grindel. And we'll have fun, you know, in the castle. I mean, it's Princess Pride. Have fun storming the castle. Meanwhile, me and the missus are, it's weird. It's odd. It's Seemingly out of place, unless the poet is intending there to be irony. And I think the poet is intending irony. The glorious king had said against Grendel, a hall guardian as men entered said, who did special service for the king of the Danes, kept guard against the giant. Surely the Gaitish prince greatly trusted his mighty strength, the maker's favor, when he took off his iron burning, undid his helmet. And so what does Beowulf do? <coughs> Not like in the god-awful CGI movie with, what's her name, Mrs. Brad Pitt with the tail and everything. Oh, he's stupid. He doesn't strip naked, okay? What he does is he takes off his male shirt. Why? Try sleeping with 60 pounds of steel wrapped around you. Not comfortable. So he takes that off and he puts it at his head because what they're doing is they're lying down, they push, you know, there's benches here, 
They're seated on, seated on benches. They push those benches up against the wall. This was standard practice. We know this from a variety of sources. <coughs> and the men lie down on their backs or on their stomachs, doesn't matter, and they place their sword. They had shoulders at work. They place their swords right here. So if they hear something stirring, they can grab that sword quickly. Beowulf does the same thing. Now, so here's Herod, right? Doors at this end. There's 15 men. How are they going to lay down? Is it going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in a straight line? Probably not. It's probably where do you put the 15th? Here maybe? Where does Beowulf lay? He's not the first person at the door. Beowulf's the next person. So maybe, maybe it's like this. We're not told exactly. What we are told is that when Grendel comes, the first person he gets is a Beowulf. He gets a guy who will later be named Hondshu. All right? So, we're told, Beowulf speaks before he lays down. I mean, it's kind of his, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep kind of a thing. I consider myself no poor in strength and battle deeds and grindle, so I will not kill him with the sword, put an end to his life, though I easily might. He knows no arts of war, blah, 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 blah. If he dare to seek out a war without weapons, 685, then let the wise Lord, the holy God, grant the judgment of glory to whichever hand seems proper to him. What is Beowulf seemingly trusting in? It's the word I've written down right here the other day. Providence. Providence. Providence is the Christian version of fate. See, fate is impersonal. Fate doesn't give a rat you know what for you. Providence does. Providence is God's ordering of the universe. Okay? So he lays down. And we're told many a bold seafarer sank to his hall rest, that is Beowulf's men. 691. None of them thought that he should thence ever again seek his own dear homeland his tribe, or the town in which he was raised. For they had heard it said that savage death had swept away far too many of the Danish folk in that wine hall. Beowulf is trusting to divine providence. Beowulf's men are thinking what? We're screwed. We're all going to die. Not one of us is going to survive. But the Lord gave a web of victory to the people of the waders, that is, the Geats, comfort and support. What has the poet just done? Yes. Suspense. Hello. Basic rule, you know, fiction. You got to build a suspense. Nope. Anglo-Saxons didn't care about suspense. It was how they got to the story that mattered. So we've been told they're going to live. So that they completely over there came their enemy through one man's craft. By his own might. And then we get this proverb, this gnome. Go by my office, it's on my office door. It is the well-known truth that mighty God has ruled mankind always and forever. That is providence. Nothing happens without God's okay. I mean, Jesus in the Gospels talks about not a sparrow falls that the Father does not know. Even the hairs on your head are counted, etc. Okay? That, by the way, I think I've mentioned this person's name. Oh, yeah, and that's, I needed to mention this. When I had those five works that Alfred translated and or wrote, I mentioned this one, but it wasn't written down. And I had a, an error. I had um, G 
Gregory's soliloquies? It wasn't Gregory, it was Augustine. St. Augustine's soliloquies. And the fifth book was Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy. And which I need to mention, talk about, and now we're going to get even farther behind. Boethius was a 6th century Roman legislator in the town of Ravenna, if I remember correctly, where the emperor then ruled from. The emperor was a German. His name was Theodoric. All right? He, Theodoric, and Boethius were good friends. And Boethius was a polymath. He wrote about everything. He knew everything. Translated works from Hebrew into Latin, translated uh, works from Greek into Latin, from the Greek fathers, etc., etc. Okay? Somebody told Theodoric that Boethius and a few other men were plotting against him. Theodoric believed the accusation, threw Boethius in prison, capital punishment. It was a capital crime. No trial, jury, nothing of it. <coughs> so, while in prison, Boethius writes what's called the Consolation of Philosophy. It's the most important work for the Middle Ages because it's the most widely read and most widely commented on and quoted from work of the Middle Ages except for the Bible. So you got the Bible and then Boethius. In, in Boethius, Boethius is sitting there. The, it's about, the thing is written in five books. Okay. And in the first one, Boethius is moaning and whining and complaining how bad life is. And the goddess, philosophy, appears in his room. And she's like, Boethius, come on. You've read enough to know bad things happen to good people. <laughs> and look at how you're responding. Because what's he doing? Whining, moaning, and complaining. He ought to be responding like a good Roman. Suck it up. Stiff upper lip. Wanderer approach, right? And so she goes through this big, long process to console. Comfort, consolation, frovra, the word I've focused on, to console Boethius. And what she ultimately gets to, the last book of the five, is all about providence. The first few are about why bad things happen in the world, etc. Where is, how can God be good if bad things happen? That's one of the issues she deals with, okay? By the time she gets to the fifth book, she uses this image. Because Boethius is still trying to wrap his mind around how come bad things can happen if God is so good? He's thinking fate, predestination. She's like, no, 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 it's the wrong way to look at it. Here's life. You're born, you die. Simple story. How do we experience life? It's not a deep question. Real surface level answer. How do you experience time? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Notice, you know, the Chinese app. Tick tock. What's it do? Wastes time. Okay? My opinion. We experience it moment by moment, right? We don't experience tomorrow, today. We have to get through today to get to tomorrow. So, what can we do in terms of time? Same kind of thing was discussed in Bede. Why? Bede knew, read, Boethius. Okay? With the talk about the pagan and the, the pagan Germanic system and the Christian system. We can look back. Look, you guys are all young. You can look back and look at your life up until your point. I can look back and look at my life up to my point. And I've got 40 plus years or maybe 40 years more to look back on than you do. That means I have more data points. I have more pieces to the puzzle. So I can see 
kind of the puzzle from the past and maybe project what the puzzle is going to look like, but none of us can see what? We can see the whole puzzle. Or let me use another metaphor, tapestry. As we experience our lives, it's like a tapestry being woven. We are, we are what? We are a thread. And that thread goes in, out, over, and under. And when you look at a tapestry from the back, what's it look like? A mess. It's a mess. Like rip open a computer and there's wires. And that's what it looks like. You flip it over, and what do you see? Oh, this beautiful image. We experience the mess. What Boethius learns from philosophy is that up here is God, and God is separated from us by this huge, if I can spell it, chasm. Okay? But how does God experience time? He doesn't. Why? Because God is eternal. E stands for X, out of. Out of time. We experience time, right, moment by moment. How does God see time? Eternally, outside of it. So, this becomes the eternal present. All of time, blink of an eye. God sees time how? St. Paul writes about from the foundations of the world, before the foundations of the world, Christ was crucified. To the end of Revelation and beyond. That's how, according to Boethius, God experiences slash sees time. So everything that occurs is seen in an instant in God's eye, so to speak. That's how providence because God knows everything that's going to happen. Why? Because he sees it. He sees it all happening. And our minds do what? Not enough duct tape in the world to strap your mind together to keep all that. We don't experience it that way. We're slogging through, you know, think of the three Michigan State students the other day. God sees it all, okay? And what's that meant to be for Boethius? Well, if God sees it all, God what? God knows how it's going to end. And providence weaves in our actions, our decisions with God's governance. So, back to the poem. It is a well-known truth that mighty God has ruled mankind always and forever. If you're a good Scots Presbyterian Calvinist, you would say, oh, that's just predestination, which is nothing but a Christian form of fate. You have no choice in the matter, according to predestination. This means, yes, you do. And every choice you make is what? It's a little movement of that thread. It's part of the creation of that tapestry of each individual life. So, Grindel comes. We get three different times Excuse me. We're told that Grindel starts to come. There is a um, article, can't remember the name of the author, called uh, Design for Terror. Something about Design for Terror in Beowulf. And it discusses the language that's used to describe Grindel's coming. In the dark night he came creeping, the shadow goer. Like he goes in shadows. The bowmen slept to her hold to her, who were to hold that horned hall, that is, Beowulf's men. They all fall asleep. All but one. Who's the one who isn't asleep? It's Beowulf. Okay? It was well known to men that the demon foe could not drag them under the dark shadows if the maker did not wish it. Now that kind of implies what for the previous 12 years? This is the poet speaking. This is not Beowulf. So this is the poet or the shope 
singing the song in a hall full of warriors. It is a well-known, it is well-known to men, Grendel could not drag them under the dark shadows if God didn't wish it, didn't allow it. In other words, the last 12 years was God's will. Which, down here, we think what? How could God be good and allow that to happen? Think of a Jew who survived the Nazi camps. How could God be good if he allowed that to happen? Think of a Christian who survived the Soviet gulags. How could, etc. But he, not God, wakeful, keeping watch for his enemy, awaited, <coughs> excuse me, enraged the outcome of battle. Who's awake? Beowulf is. This is not Beowulf at the front door. See, I, I don't know about you. I'm one of Beowulf's men. I'm like, Beowulf, come here. Right there. <laughs> you sleep right in front of the door. Why? Because Grendel's going to come through that door. I'll, I'll stay back here. But if he does that, that means Grendel is still right by the door, in which case he can see the enemy a little bit. Wait, say that again? So if Beowulf is the one by the door, and then he leaps up and he starts fighting Grendel right by the door, and Grendel's like, crap, he can easily flee if he's still right by the door in front of the entrance. If Beowulf lets him flee, because your, your comment is predicated on if Grendel comes in, Beowulf doesn't get hold of him. And we're going to be told in a moment what Grendel's M.O. is, his modus operandi, every time he attacks. He comes in and he does this. In other words, he salutes. He's like, hi, nice to meet you. My name's Grendel. I'm a monster. I eat people. Okay? Because he's going to reach down pretty soon and grab the first guy. Okay, so we get the next fit 11. Then from the moor in a blanket of mist, Grindel came stalking. And we're told, 7, 11. Godus era bar. God's ire bore. He, God's ire bore. He bore God's ire. What's ire? Anger. Anger. Okay? Most important word in that half line is this one. What does it mean to bear God's ire? Or, <coughs> what's it mean to bear something? Carry? Carry? What else? To be burdened with. To be burdened with. Ooh, I like that. I don't think I've ever had a student translate it that way. What else? Shoulder it. Shoulder it. Could be suffer it. I mean, you guys are giving a lot of different readings than I've gotten over the last 30 years. <laughs> Carried, shouldered, suffered, endured, brought. Okay. It's usually translated or interpreted to mean God's ire is on Grindel. Okay? What else can bore mean? A bear that some of you have suggested. He's like carrying. If he's carrying in this sense, what does that mean? Yeah, what else? It's not mine. This is yours. What's he carrying? God's anger. What did the poet say? Line 707. If the maker did not wish it. Well, Grindel's been coming. So it's obvious the maker did wish that the demon foe could drag them under the dark shadows. If the maker wished it, 
then what is Grendel doing to the people it drags into the dark, he drags into the dark shadows. He is possibly God's will. He is bearing God's ire. He's, Louder? Oh, he's punishing. He's punishing. He, not Grendel, God. So God is punishing this man for having a party 12 years ago. No, not necessarily. Because isn't that why Grendel started killing people in the first place? Because of the noise which served him? So he started like going and killing these men. Well, that's what's that's what prompts Grendel. Right. Okay. However, if Grendel is carrying out the will of God, so what, what, is, is, what is God's motivation? Okay, for? okay. Good question. Because that gets back to this kind of thing in let's say the divine will, and what happens down here? Human will, according to the Boethian context, or idea, these work together. What's a phrase we use today? We hear it all over. We hear it in business, we hear it in education, and none of them have a freaking idea of what they're talking about by using this word. It's synergy. Sin together, ergy action. The divine will working together with human will. That is, we do what we think is right. Hamlet says, oh, there's a providence that shapes our ends, rough hew them as we will. That is, we rough hew. Rough hew is like you take down a tree and you get an axe and you start to trim that wood. Okay? You're rough hewing it. It's not polished, it's not smooth. But the providence is doing what? It's taking that tree to produce something else. All right? They're working together. So here, God. If we take that line 707, 706, the demon foe could not drag them under the dark shadows if the maker did not wish it. Notice that begins with, it was well known to men. Was. Poet doesn't say it is. Why not? Okay, that's possible, or because this is the poet. The poet is saying, it used to be known that God allowed these kinds of things happen to happen. And he's implying, we don't know that anymore. Isn't it, so I was thinking back earlier, didn't they say that <coughs> the, um, the Danes, like, of the hall, they were, like, praying to, like, things other than God, so maybe yeah. that's why. In that 175, in that 175 to 88, they remembered hell, we were told. And they did what? They went back to their old practices. Okay. Now, that's kind of more in line with the modern Baptist, you know, if you don't know Jesus, then you're already in hell, and you're going to, you die, you're going straight to hell, there's no possibility for redemption, etc. The poet here, okay, God's wishing this stuff to happen. If it is divine providence and punishment, why are they being punished? They, the Danes, not Grendel. Okay, Grendel's the instrument of God's punishment. Why are they being punished? Could be because it goes back to they remembered hell, but that's after Grendel first comes. Could it be something else? Who avenges the feud between Cain and Abel? God. Kinslayer. Kinslayer. Are we told, like, what happened, like, with his brother? Nope. Okay, so. But it's ultimately it's just, is an unplaced repayment for unplaced Kinslayer. Could be. I, that's what I'm suggesting. Could, the whole damn point was the unfair children. 
Good. No, not the whole damn poem. <laughs> part of the damn poem. <laughs> the Grindel part could be. And again, this is something, the way I'm interpreting it, the way I'm, I'm looking at this, I can't think of anybody who's written about, about it this way, who's looked at it in this way. Okay? But notice how the lines are woven together. You pull on that thread and you try to pull all of that quote unquote Christian stuff out, you're not going to be left with much. It's so tightly woven. And we're going to hear language later on in the poem about how a poet creates. It, one word finds another, and that, by that one word, also one idea finds another. If God is really, let's say, angry at kin slaying, the ultimate one being this one, and Cain and his descendants are punished, there's a problem with this, whether Hrothgar is aware of it or not. See, Hrothgar does what when Beowulf gives his little speech? He blows it off. He's like, oh, it's just a flit. That's all it is. And yet when Grendel starts, before that, when Grendel starts coming, what does Hrothgar immediately assume? First night, we're told what happens the next morning. He sits down and he mourns. And the Grindel comes again. And he sits down and he mourns. What does he never do? Why me? And yet, we're going to be told, after Beowulf kills Grindel's mother, Hrothgar ruled for 50 years. Peace, prosperity, happiness, everything. And we're going to be told in that little speech that he gives, every day he thinks what? It's going to be like this forever. Until one morning, it isn't. What might the poet, whoever authored this, or orally composed it, be suggesting about human existence? that we saw in both The Wanderer and The Seafarer, and to some extent, Dream of the Rood. Everything here is transitory. Change is the nature of life. Hrothgar thought, I mean, I'm 48 years into a totally peaceful reign. Everything's fine. I mean, jump way ahead. Beowulf's going to rule for 50 years before the dragon comes, just like Hrothgar did. During that 50 years, total peace, total happiness, for the simple reason that he's Beowulf and nobody's stupid enough to challenge him. But what happens with 50 years of peace? What happens, you know, Hrothgar, 50 years of peace. That 50 years of peace comes after his building of Herod, his having amassed a huge tribe of men, his having defeated others in battle. What kind of warriors are you going to have? Are you? How do you train warriors if there's no real battle? Katanas? Wooden swords, ooh, that hurts, you know. Uh, nothing like the real thing, okay? I mean, there's all kinds of issues in the poem. It's, it's like, eh, I don't want to address that. Why? This is a rock poem. Beowulf's the hero. He's the man. Don't diss Beowulf. So, Grindel comes. Under the clouds he came, so we get in the dark night he came, then from the moor he came, under the clouds he came. That one article talks about, you know, building up terror and such. He comes to the hall 720, that warrior came on his journey. Notice, that warrior, Grendel, not the fiend, not the evil ghast, not the demon, that warrior came. Bereft of joys, the door burst open fast in its forged bands when his fingers touched it. 
Notice, we're not told he opens the door. It's just he touches it. It bursts open. Why? Probably because this is an old image. There's an analog of this in what's called the Greta Saga, an old Norse tale, where a guy named Gretir fights a draugr, which is something like Grindel is. And the monster, his name is Glom, or Glomer, when he comes in and touches the door, the door bursts open. He doesn't have to open it or anything. It's like there's a spell, okay? Door swings open, and what happens? Notice the narrator takes us in, or the, the speaker, takes us in Grindel's mind. Bloody-minded, swollen with rage, he swung open the hall's mouth. And immediately afterwards, the fiend strode across the paved floor, went angrily in his eyes, stood a light not fair, light with these. <laughs> How not fair is it? Like hell, you know, burning in his eyes. Glowing like fire, okay? Again, same thing, same description of glowing fire-like eyes with Glomer in the Greta Saga. Only difference is, in the Greta Saga, if you look into Glomer's eyes and see that fire, you'll fall under his spell, okay? So, he sees many a soldier, they're all sleeping, a large company of things, and he laughs inside. Don't know what Grindel sounds like when he laughs, but inside he laughs, because what's he thinking? Hors d'oeuvre, hors d'oeuvre, hors d'oeuvre, appetizer, appetizer, main course, dessert, you know. But it was not his fate to taste any more of the race of mankind after that night. The kinsman of Helak, the mighty one, beheld how that man-eater planned to proceed with his sudden assault. How did he behold? See, this is a problem no critic wants to address. Not that the monster meant to delay. He sees at once his first pass, a sleeping man. Beowulf watches this. Talk about expendable. I mean, eatable, extendable, extendable. He watches Grindel reach down, grab this guy, slit him open, bite into his joints, drink the blood, gobble his flesh in gobbets. It eats the whole freaking guy. Okay? And then he takes the next one. He's just going to go down the lines. And the next one's Beowulf. So Grindel reaches out, grasps for Beowulf, and what does Beowulf do? That, apparently, no warrior had done in the last 12 years. Hi, nice to meet you. My name's Beowulf, Monster Slayer. Here's my card, you know. Because as soon as Grendel reaches and grasps Beowulf's hand, and Beowulf grasps his hand, <laughs> claw, whatever you want to call it, what does Grendel immediately realize? As soon as a shepherd of sins, it's the exact same word that is used to describe kings. But notice, he, he's not a shepherd of sheep or people. He shepherds sins. Like, come here, little lust, little vice, little. Discovered that he had never met on Middle Earth in any region of the world another man with a greater hand grip in his heart. He was afraid for his life, but none the sooner could he flee. In other words, he thought, oh, sh I'm dead. His mind was eager to escape the darkness. As soon as Beowulf seemingly touches him, he's like, I gotta leave. He wanted to seek out a host of devils. His habit there was nothing like he'd ever met before. The good kinsman, if he alike, remembered then his evening speech. So like, Beowulf grabbed him by the hand. We're told, meanwhile, in Grindel's mind, and then back in Beowulf's mind, and what does Beowulf think? I said I would kill him or die trying. And Beowulf does what? He stood upright and seized him fast. So Beowulf's lying down, reaches up, and then he stands up. What has he just done? 
We equaled the situation. Okay, now Grindel's probably a lot taller than Beowulf, but he's still Beowulf now on his feet. His fingers burst. Who's the his? Grindel's. And he's like, I'm on. He meant, if he might, to turn away further and flee away to his lair in the fen. Notice, if he might, if he was able, read it in context. Okay, what's the larger context? It was well known to men that the demon foe could not drag them under the dark shadows if the maker did not wish it. God has ruled mankind always and forever. I'm not saying Grindel is thinking this. I'm saying the poet puts these words about Grindel, if he was able, in this larger context. Okay? What does Grindel do to escape? And it's Grindel that does it. It's not Beowulf. He wrenches his arm off to get away from Beowulf. Beowulf's just standing there holding him. We're going to be told later, it's not just the simple Beowulf stands there holding him and Grindel runs away and leaves his arm hanging. They thrash each other. They throw each other up against the walls, all the while holding on. Well, Beowulf's holding on to him. Okay? Beowulf's men try to get in the fight, too. Their swords don't do any good. Grindel has a spell woven about him. Okay? Oh, time's up. Sorry. So we've got what, 200 lines? <laughs> <laughs>